much, so very much to get to. Starting with, I don't know if you heard about this, but a major celebrity breakup over the weekend. Donald Trump and Mike Pence have gone the way of <laughs> Kim and Ye. Uh, Trump has been blowing the old Pence should have overturned the election horn a lot lately. So on Friday, Mike Pence marched into an event at the Federal Society in Florida, just a couple of hours up the road from Mar-a-Lardo. And after a year of being thrown <laughs> under the Access Hollywood bus, Mike Pence finally kind of a little bit stood up for himself. There are those in our party who believe that as the presiding officer over the joint session of Congress, that I possess unilateral authority to reject electoral college votes. And I heard this week that President Trump said I had the right to overturn the election. But President Trump is wrong. What? I had no, no right to overturn Ugh. the election. The presidency belongs to the American people and the American people alone. You know what? That's just a waste of perfectly good chicken is what that is. It's but those are um, strong words. President Trump was wrong. You know he spent all day practicing that in front of a mirror as <laughs> mother patted him gently on the britches. And he didn't stop there. Pence said, there's no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. Well, if that isn't Stella getting her groove back, I don't know what is. <laughs> The vice poodle has been unleashed. What a weird turn of events. I thought for sure Melania would dump Trump before Mike Pence did. <laughs> I guess that means they for sure won't be running together. Who will be his running mate? What if he picks his son, DJ TJ? Can you <laughs> imagine we have to worry about two Donald Trumps? Don and Donner. But <laughs> we are getting more shockingly uh, not shocking details about what Trump was up to on January 6th. According to his former press secretary, he was confused as to why members of his staff didn't enjoy watching him rewind his favorite moments from the riots as they happened on TV. Apparently, when he saw something he particularly liked, he'd rewind it and say, look how they're fighting for me. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a joke. Good old Captain Bone Spurs. He always loved watching others do the fighting. He really, can you imagine how spectacularly pathetic you have to be to get pleasure from watching that? He probably made Don Jr. and Eric wrestle each other for spaghetti every Friday night. <laughs> In the end, the White House finally did get him to record a message asking the rioters to stop, but they had to do multiple takes because in the first few, he neglected to tell the rioters to stop, which was the whole point of making the video. <laughs> Not to mention, he told those people he was gonna walk to the Capitol with them. An hour and a half later, he's sitting with his TiVo remote replaying footage of them getting tear gassed. He's a wonderful man, I think is what I'm trying to say. Last week, you know, we were talking about that House committee is looking into the attack on the Capitol, had to tape many of Trump's White House documents back together because he'd just rip them apart. He'd tear uh, briefings, schedules, articles, memos, whatever he got his little orange hands on, he'd rip it up. <laughs> And he also took official White House documents home. The National Archives had to travel to Mar-a-Lago last month to retrieve 15 boxes of records he wasn't supposed to take, including his so-called love letters from Kim Jong-un, uh, which <laughs> they found under the mattress of his waterbed. But taking in... <laughs> This is a violation of the Presidential Records Act. It says, whoever having the custody of any such record, proceeding map, et cetera, or other thing willfully and unlawfully conceals, removes, mutilates, obliterates, falsifies, or destroys the same shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than three years or both and shall forfeit his office and be disqualified from holding any office under the United States. This is exactly what he did, right? What are we waiting for? Disqualify away. Bring in... <laughs> Bring in the disqualifying squad, for God's sake. So then over the weekend, Trump's club slash house Mar-a-Lago put out this, this enticing flyer. It says, great music will be played during dinner on Friday and Saturday evenings with President Trump playing the role of disc jockey. The music will be amazing. It'll be lots of fun. It'll go until the late evening. For those who will be unable to be seated, the bar will be open for drinks. We look forward to seeing everyone again very soon, President Donald J. Trump. <laughs> DJ Don. And I want you to imagine now what song this great lover of music might pick to get his guests up and going. Any guesses? Well, here, I think you'll, you'll realize that this is the only choice there is.
That's right. YMCA is an inexplicable campaign rally song. It's, the man basically <laughs> lives in a catering hall. <laughs> also, he dances like a rock'em sock'em robot. He's like... <laughs> This country's not a happy place right now. There are uprisings happening all around us. In Vacaville, California, even a group of fourth graders has had enough. Step by step, students left class to rally out front. That's how we feel about it. We feel really strongly about it. We want to protest for it and bring it back. What do we want? Chocolate milk! When do we want it? Now! Students say that delicious drink needs to come back to class. Officials say they hear the students loud and clearly. I appreciate and decided to do chocolate milk one day every other week. <laughs> All right. That's a, had a peaceful protest for chocolate milk. This is where Gandhi and Sonny the Cocoa for Cocoa Puffs bird intersect, right there. <laughs> Speaking of strange new uh, couples, uh, big mergers on the way between Spirit and Frontier Airlines. They've agreed to come together and form one. If the deal goes through, the, they would be the fifth largest airline in the country, and also the worst. <laughs> Frontier and Spirit believe that by combining their assets, they will have almost enough seatbelts for all their passengers. <laughs> it should be great. You know, the Olympics are happening. The Olympics are underway, and the words on everyone's lips are, oh, they are? <laughs> Friday was the opening ceremony in Beijing. Did you watch the opening ceremony? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> It was nice. There were fabulous, beautiful people from all over the world, brightly colored flags, flamboyant costumes. It was the closest China will ever get to throwing a gay pride parade. <laughs> One of the athletes that caught the world's attention is Nathan Crumpton. He's a skeleton racer from American Samoa. He is all oiled up. I mean, normally you wouldn't want to be so oily in that proximity to a torch, but that's Nathan for you. <laughs> you know, they had to make all the snow for the games. It, they didn't make it, it's artificial snow. And the venue for the women's freestyle ski jumping competition, not only is the snow fake, there, it looks like an abandoned power plant, primarily because <laughs> it is an abandoned power plant. They, those are cooling towers from an old coal-fired steel mill. It seems ironic to hold a Winter Olympic event in front of the reason we don't have winter anymore. But <laughs> there have been a lot of complaints from athletes, which we often hear during the Winter Olympics, uh, who had the misfortune of testing positive for COVID. They're forced to isolate in a quarantine hotel. They put them all in this hotel. One by athlete from Russia shared a photo of a meal she was served at the hotel. It was uh, potatoes, plain pasta, some kind of charred meat, and then something. They're feeding them like uh, divorced dads feed their kids. <laughs> <laughs> but despite the criticism from the athletes, the current president of the IOC and former fire festival organizer, Ja Rule, <laughs> says these complaints are totally overblown. This is a huge week sports-wise. This is maybe the biggest week ever. This is the first year that the Olympics and the Super Bowl are happening at the same time. On Sunday, Super Bowl 56 is taking place right here in LA. The Cincinnati Bengals are playing our hometown Los Angeles Rams. The lineup for the halftime show is absolutely great. It's Eminem, Snoop Dogg, Mary J. Blige, Kendrick Lamar, and Dr. Dre, which was exciting news for everybody, with one notable exception, and that is Greg Kelly of Newsmax. F the NFL. Yeah, totally. <laughs> F the NFL. They're exploitive. They're anti-American. They're a thousand percent woke. They barely even show the national anthem anymore. It's too touchy. And for entertainment, this Super Bowl, who do we have? Snoop Dogg and his friend, Dr. Dre. Two guys who really love the slogan, F the police. Yeah, F the police. At this moment, these guys, one who helped coin the phrase, the other who sings it all the time, F the police. Wow. That 33 seconds had more fake outrage than all the WrestleManias combined, didn't it? <laughs> but go on. And here's more. Dipping through the city with a Glock in a Range Rover. If you sleeping, probably not with the same ho. I won't continue, all right? You get the idea. These are horrible, horrible words. Oh, you wounded little snowflake. <laughs> We might have to make him a colonel in the cancel culture army, right? 
By the way, since you're worried about a song that came out in 1992, here's a picture of Snoop Dogg since with one police officer and two police officers and six police officers. It seems like they made up, so you can calm down, Karen. Hey, not only is this uh, big sports week here in Los Angeles, tomorrow's when the Oscar nominations come out. I will be fast asleep when that happens, but someone who won't is Louis Vertel. He's one of our Oscar crazy writers, and he's here now to Vertel it like it is. Louis. The Oscars are my favorite day of the year. Who doesn't want to watch Nicole Kidman and Viola Davis win awards in front of Jack Nicholson, who is definitely sleeping? <laughs> Tomorrow morning, the Oscar nominations are announced at 5.18 a.m., literally, and I will be up in my living room, shivering in the dark like a serial killer. <laughs> Plenty of great actors are up for the big awards, but I have one word of advice to the performers who don't hear their names called and don't receive a nomination. Congratulations. <laughs> because being snubbed is better than winning. Well, well, what do you mean it's better than winning? I'll tell you. OK. <laughs> you don't need a gown. You don't need a speech. And for the rest of time, a loyal and militant army of gay men will loudly proclaim that justice be done. <laughs> In 1954, Judy Garland lost Best Actress in A Star Is Born to Grace Kelly in The Country Girl, a movie I dare you to sit through. <laughs> Bring this up anywhere in West Hollywood and you will hear screaming in the distance, Judy was robbed! <laughs> and then 50 other effeminate voices will join in, calling for Grace Kelly's execution, even though she's been dead since 1982. <laughs> you think being gay is about same-sex attraction. Not true. It's about not letting go. Andrew Garfield in The Social Network, snubbed. Amy Adams in Arrival, snubbed. Even Citizen Kane didn't win Best Picture. And they've all been immortalized because they lost or weren't even nominated. Can you remember who won Best Supporting Actress two years ago? I bet Laura Dern herself has forgotten. <laughs> She's too busy being 6'4 and unbothered. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know who hasn't forgotten? The sick, twisted fans of Jennifer Lopez, who was not even nominated for her role in Hustlers as a wise pole dancer with a heart of gold. <laughs> How the hell did this snub happen? Jennifer Lopez is a wise pole dancer with a heart of gold. <laughs> she did a whole Super Bowl about it. <laughs> but it's better she got snubbed because these scorned singer-actresses always come back stronger and harder. In 1985, Cher was snubbed for the movie Mask. But two years later, she came back to win Best Actress for Moonstruck, beating Meryl Streep. You can't stop Cher. You step on her and she just grows a headdress three times her size. <laughs> if you get snubbed at the Oscars, you're in the same company as Do the Right Thing. It didn't even get nominated in 1989, the year Driving Miss Daisy won. Which is maybe not surprising, considering in 1989, most of the Academy looked like Miss Daisy. <laughs> Voters thought, I'm also white and like being driven around. I'm voting for that. <laughs> and finally, Glenn Close. Eight nominations, no wins. I've watched Glenn Close lose Oscars just as my gay ancestors watched Glenn Close lose Oscars. <laughs> it's a tradition passed down through time, like folk stories. Nothing bonds Oscar fans like Glenn Close's losing streak. You know why Glenn Close doesn't have an Oscar? Same reason Bjork doesn't have a Grammy. We can agree they're geniuses, but unfortunately, they scared your dad once. <laughs> and voters have been nervous ever since. So if tomorrow morning Kristen Stewart or Penelope Cruz or Jessica Chastain doesn't get the nomination she's looking for, fear not. You won't be invited to the Dolby, but you'll be a hero to a bunch of grown men who still sound like their mom on the phone. <laughs> Louis Vertel, everybody. If you like that video, then put a ring on it. Click the subscribe button below. Oh, oh, oh.